Hello and welcome to the Investing on the Go podcast brought to you by Fund Calibre. I'm Ryan Lightfoot-Brown and today I have the pleasure of being joined by Bertrand Cliquet, the Elite Rated Manager of the Lazard Global Equity Franchise Fund. Bertrand, thank you very much for your time. Good morning, Ryan. And now your fund is the, the Global Franchise Fund, but what exactly qualifies the Global Franchise? Is it that it's got a big brand name, such like Google or Amazon, or is it uh, something a bit different? Can you maybe talk about that sort of economic franchise model? Yes, I think, Ryan, you're spot on. Uh, the, the concept of an economic franchise for us is, is not only about investing in, in good businesses. Um, what we seek are businesses where we have uh, a superior ability to forecast future earnings. Because our process is very focused on valuation. And therefore, if you have companies where you have a very strong confidence in future earnings and a, a margin of, of error around those earnings that is very small, then you, you can be more assertive on valuation. So yes, we'll have some um, you know, large companies, SEL or Luxotica, for example. The case of Amazon is an interesting one. Um, we certainly don't deny that it is an excellent business. Um, one of the issues we have with Amazon is that we very frankly uh, and, and um, you know, humbly said that we do not know how much money it's going to make in five or 10 years time. And you can go all the way through the spectrum they may continue to be exceptionally profitable in AWS and they may capitalize on the retail business uh, on the one hand and therefore may end up as the most profitable business on the planet. On the other end of the spectrum, you may see competition coming through uh, AWS. And you know, remember, you have a, an extremely powerful competitor in Alibaba that hasn't cracked their market. And therefore, you may see some of the challenges of you know, the ongoing retail business has you know Tesco has faced in the in, in the in the last 10 years for example and therefore Amazon isn't in the universe uh, we're not restricted to um, you know huge businesses as well some uh, more niche businesses are part of the of the of the universe so Fresenius medical care which is a German company they're one of the leaders globally of uh, dialysis treatment for people with kidney failure uh, are one of the stocks in, in the portfolio Actually, while well, we're on Europe, you've um, you've got quite a lot of the portfolio in Europe. It's been one that's been it's a region that's been dominated by quite negative headlines in the first first quarter of the year. Um, but you've got now nearly a third of the portfolio in there. Um, are you sort of positioned for a strong recovery in the continent, or is this where you see um, most of your sort of value opportunities? Yes, it's it's certainly value driven. The start of the year and and the volatility we saw in the in the start of the year gave us a number of really nice opportunities. Um, uh, in the uh, healthcare sector in the UK, we can come back certainly to that, or um, in in the utility sector for that matter. So we bought into the national grid of Italy, Turner. We bought a, a French motorway business, Vinci, um, and therefore the weight of into Europe has um, has really uh, increased as we see these um, you know much lower share prices. And how is that sort of related to performance? Um, it has helped. So what we think is essential in our process is to keep this valuation discipline. Um, there are certainly uh, probably three ways we make money for investors. Uh, the first one is when you have big sector rotations, as we saw at the back end of 2018, where you know stocks and Fresenius Medical Care I mentioned earlier fell 25% for you know you know limited uh, underlying reasons and we'll we'll seize the opportunities uh, on on that basis. So what we do when we build a portfolio is we rank companies in the order of declining upsides. Um, you know such rotation can change the uh, the ranking uh, of of stocks in this uh, in this order and therefore will reposition the portfolio the second one is when you have an industry that is um, a challenge or you have a question mark on its future profits so when the tech sector faced a question mark around the transition to the cloud in 2014 15 um, our belief was that some companies such as microsoft for example um, would um, you know, come out of it, um, you know, quite positively, and therefore a lot of tech stocks at the time became, um, you know, some of the top ten positions in our portfolio. And and the last one is when uh, you know a single stock faces uh, a short term blip, so they are living and breathing creatures, uh, and sometimes you know they are challenged. Um, and and you know our job, as we saw with Tapestry, which was one of the largest contributors last year, is you have a luxury good company that sees uh, all of its stores closed for a big part of the year, uh, the market panicking, uh, and our thesis was very much based on a, an improvement in their value. 
value chain management um, and ability to uh, limit their discount to their product, therefore margin improvement and a business coming out of this pandemic, actually a stronger business than it, it entered it. And no, ESG has been a sort of a key word in the industry over the last few years. Um, your fund screens for ESG factors. What exactly do you look for? Um, what does this add? And does this eliminate some of the sort of big names that we might we might have thought about? Yes, exactly. And and to give you some uh, some background, we, we're blessed uh, in our team to have uh, a colleague called John Mulcrony. So John um, has uh, a PhD in atmospheric chemistry from the uh, in the 1990s. Actually, very few people uh, thought well, that climate change was something worth spending time on. And and John certainly did uh, extremely thorough uh, work uh, on 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 the topic. So on the on the environmental side, that's uh, certainly uh, you know something worth bearing in mind. In terms of how um, serious and committed the team is, and and how um, you know scientifically we we approach this uh, this uh, and rigorously we, we approach the environmental problematic, um, you know I think ESNG for us, if you think about our focus on forecastability, well, sustainability isn't very far off as, as a concept, and therefore we've always had uh, this focus and uh, approaching this problematic as. Um, you know, uh, very much any business opportunity or threat. Um, I'll take one example, which is probably the most, uh, uh, you know, relevant um, in in the case of a, a quality portfolio, but we have never invested in the tobacco sector. So we've run this strategy uh, since 2013, the fund since 2015, and we never had uh, in our investable universe, uh, let alone in the portfolio of tobacco company. And, and the reason that was the case is the societal implication of smoking made us unable to have a strong view on the long-term growth of the industry. So we thought because of the S in the SNG, uh, there was a challenge that we felt made us unable to, to narrow down this future forecast. Uh, with there are opportunities as well. So some of the newer investments, the portfolio I mentioned, Turner, the national grid of Italy, we own the national grid in the UK. Uh, these companies are key enablers uh, of the energy transition. Um, energy transition can happen without the national grid. We know we all want to go green in one go. What we're not ready to accept is when we, we flick the switch, you know, light doesn't go on. And, and national grid is one of the key enablers. So you see companies with um, a very high degree of predictability in their earnings, you know, highly regulated earnings, increasing their investments by the tune of 20, 25% at some, uh, you know, and, and making them, um, you know, nicely growing companies for the foreseeable future. Okay, and what about the sort of healthcare in a sort of similar sort of space? I know we've touched on a couple of names. You've got around a quarter of the portfolio in it. Um, it's had uh, an interesting 18 months, let's say. Um, what's so attractive about the sector that makes you want to, to add a lot of companies into your portfolio? Yes. So, um, Ryan, I should say in the, in the healthcare sector, there was one big part we don't invest in, which is the big pharma companies. Uh, the reason that's the case is their, their value is very much linked to the probability of success uh, you ascribe to their pipeline of new drugs, and therefore doesn't really go hand in hand with, with forecastability. Uh, but we do invest in a lot of um, um, business that provide services to the healthcare industry or medical equipment. And for us, it is a collection of very high quality businesses, and we've had opportunities over the years to um, to seize uh, you know, volatility in this sector. That was the case uh, in the aftermath of the Obamacare legislation in the US. And what we've seen uh, due to the pandemic is that um, elective surgeries were canceled. So think about a business such as Medtronic, the largest medical device provider in the world. Half their business is linked to elective surgeries. Um, so we saw derating in these stocks, and that's one of the reasons we have increased the weight to the sector and added new names. So in the first quarter this year, we bought Smith & Nephew, uh, one of the largest provider or manufacturer of uh, orthopedic prothesis, um, for example, because they were uh, heavily impacted by the fact that, well, if you, um, you know, wanted your, your hip and, and, or your knee replaced, it was deemed um, elective and could be postponed. And our thesis relies on the fact that not only will we have a reversal to uh, you know, normal levels, but you know, medical practitioners do tell us that we need to catch up as well gradually, uh, and we are really playing this catch up with this stock. Okay, I'm moving um, completely sideways now. Um, one of the other companies you've got is H and R Block. It's an American 
um, tax company, for those who don't know it. Um, it's had, again, a, a bit of a rocky period. But do you think that um, perhaps sort of looking at a bit from a sort of sideways angle, um, the increased need for H&R Block as a company with consumers worried about cryptocurrency, it's also been one of the um, big headline grabbers of the year. Um, with the sort of tax implications of that, do you think there's a bit of an angle there for them? Yes, I think there is. So this is a, a business that um, you know certainly has been challenged with some of the moves towards uh, you know computer-based tax returns. Um, it's worth noting that the core of their business, which is the assisted tax return, um, it, it is important for their um, you know for eighty percent of their assisted tax return customers, they, the, the money they get back from the government is about 20% of their disposable income. So in, in other words, you know, you really need the service to avoid getting it wrong uh, because it's such an important part of, of, uh, of the household income. Um, you know, uh, there are two things benefiting them this year. Uh, first is two tax events uh, because last year the tax uh, year was postponed. Um, you have as well the stimulus money coming through. Um, the crypto is interesting because you know you have uh, you know it does trigger a number of capital gains. Uh, they are taxable events uh, and it, it certainly helps their business. Fundamentally for us, uh, what we focus on is the fact that their product offering um, you know has significantly improved. They are getting share again. And this is a business where you know you have a single digit P level for a, a net cash business. Um, and you know you can only justify it on on the basis that the business becoming derelict essentially. Uh, and if you uh, and the market gains confidence that there is growth in this business, um, you know this is a superb opportunity. Okay, and then I think we'll give you a bit of a, a freelance at the end. Um, what what would you say is sort of the one stock in the portfolio that excites you the most? Um, I think Nielsen. Uh, so Nielsen is, I think, when I said, you know, the three ways we we make money for investors, you know, this is clearly one of the businesses that was a uh, challenge. So Nielsen historically had two businesses. One was audience measurement. So who's watching what on TV, listening to what on the radio. And the other one was the scanner data. So the Nielsen scanner data, who's buying what at the supermarket. And this business has been sold. And that was clearly a challenge from a growth standpoint as uh, consumer good companies were really turning the screw on on expenses. So they were left with um, you know, this, uh, what they used to call the, the, the watch uh, business. And the market had a question mark about the relevance of this business in the digital world. And so um, we did a significant research uh, onto you know, how the business was adapting to a, a multi-platform uh, format and how uh, they could address uh, a critical need, which was providing uh, highly reliable measurement um, because their service ultimately prices advertising. So it's it's extremely important that uh, you know there is a, a broad recognition that this is uh, um, an adequate assessment of uh, you know where people spend their time. At like the back end of last year, they presented uh, uh, an offering which is called Nielsen One, which is a, a, a multi-channel uh, uh, offering, and you see that they are now able, with an increased use of technology, to assess you know when you watch something on you know, the BBC iPlayer or Netflix, or you're you're watching TV uh, on the uh, you know more regular or you know old school uh, television, um, and that is for us really interesting because we had you know poster child of what we do we had a business where there was a question mark you know is it still a good business is it still a franchise business our research um you know convinced us that yes it was a good business that yes they could address uh, this challenging uh, you know ahead and and the disruption in the industry and therefore uh, you know you would have this uh, you know uh, ability to earn a very high return capitals going forward and the market was completely ignoring it well on that uh, very interesting note Bertrand, i think we'll leave it there thank you very much for your time today thank you ryan and if you'd like to know more about the elite rated Lazard's Global Equity Franchise Funds, please visit our website, fundcaliber.com. And for more from our Investing on the Go podcast, please subscribe via your usual channels. Please remember, we've been discussing individual stocks to bring investing to life for you. It is not a recommendation to buy or sell. The fund may or may not be holding these stocks at time of your listening. Mm-hmm.